New York Central Park, children play at the base of a statue of a great man. Few of them know that the stern bronze figure mounted upon a horse is Simon Bolivar of Venezuela, the greatest of all South American heroes. Bolivar fought for liberty from Spain. He was as noble a leader in his land as George Washington was in our own country. A statue of this man is in almost every city in South America. He was born in Venezuela when it was called New Granada and was still under Spanish rule. Shortly after Columbus discovered America, the Spaniards began their conquest. Adventurers, explorers, missionaries, and soldiers, they came first to the West Indies. From there to Mexico, Panama, Peru, and Chile, they spread the Spanish Empire. But in the New World, Spaniards became Americans. Increasingly, they objected to Spanish control of their lives. Increasingly, they chafed under Spanish rule. Bolivar, like Washington, wanted freedom for these countries. Our own Declaration of Independence influenced him profoundly. Spain's grasp on America began to weaken shortly after 1800. Bolivar started his campaign of liberation by freeing the Negro slaves at Margarita Island, across New Granada, Bolivar and his army moved until they reached Guayaquil. Another liberator, Jose San Martin of Buenos Aires, organized an army at Mendoza. Scaling the Andes, he overthrew Spanish rule in Chile. He sailed to Peru and then to Ecuador to meet Bolivar. The two liberators, Bolivar and San Martin, met in Guayaquil, Ecuador in 1822. The army of Bolivar's friend, General Sucre, won a decisive victory at Ayacucho in 1824. He created Bolivia with its capital of Sucre. By 1825, the last Spanish army was defeated. Bolivar and his army of patriots marched across swollen rivers through fever-laden valleys like the Orinoco, through jungle and virgin forest, they cut their way. Through waterless desert, with tropic sun beating down, they marched. Up mountain trails, over the incredibly high passes of the Andes, Negro and white, Indian and Spanish, hungry, poorly paid, badly armed. Forward they marched. After 10 years of fighting and marching, victory and freedom were theirs. Bolivar's campaign in Venezuela was doubly difficult because of topography. As we study the country, we notice that it has four main geographic divisions. A hot, damp, tropical plain extends along the coast. A mighty range of the Andes in the west with peaks over 16,000 feet high. The Llanos, low-lying grassy plains, border the great rivers like the Orinoco. The Guiana Highlands of southern Venezuela comprise about half the territory of the country. Parts of this thickly forested and mountainous plateau have never been explored. This region possesses much natural wealth, like aluminum ore, iron, gold, and diamonds. Rubber and quinine are raised in small amounts. Rare woods, like mahogany, are brought out in large quantities. La Guaira, principal port of Venezuela, virtually slips over the mountains into the sea. It is one of the world's most beautiful harbors. The coast is narrow here, as it is at Barcelona, a small seaport near some coal mines. But in western Venezuela, the coastal plain grows wider and sometimes reaches as much as 40 miles. It is hot and unhealthy, with fever taking its annual toll. Vegetation is luxuriant. 
Bananas are only one of the many tropical foods growing everywhere in the coastal plain. Not far from the Caribbean coast are to be found sugarcane, tobacco, cacao, and coconut plantations. In the coconut groves, the workers on homemade rope devices scale the trees like circus performers. The meat and milk of the coconut provide a portion of their diet. Quantities of dried coconut are sold abroad. Formerly, coconut shells were burned as waste. Today, they are carefully saved to be used in making gas masks. Many coastal inhabitants are employed on the large cacao or chocolate tree plantations found along the coastal plain. This region exports annually as much as 50 million pounds of cacao from which the best quality chocolate is produced. Notice how the pod grows directly on the trunk. With Venezuelans, hot chocolate prepared without milk is almost as popular as coffee. From the nut which looks like a melon, the cacao seeds are extracted and dried and then ground up to make cocoa. Among the world's largest river systems is the Orinoco, which flows through the heart of the country. Its branches extend from the Amazon basin to the highlands of Colombia. With its tributaries, the Orinoco drains an area as large as Texas. Great low plains, the Llanos, are on both sides of the river. Each year when the Orinoco rises from 20 to 50 feet above normal, thousands of square miles of grasslands are flooded over. Small ocean-going steamships go to Ciudad Bolivar so that the river becomes the principal means of transportation for over two-thirds of the country. And it is more important to Venezuelan economy than the Mississippi is to our Middle West. The people who live in the grassy plains are called llaneros. They are cowboys, like the gaucho. But work on cattle ranches stops during the Orinoco flood season. Then the cowboys become fishermen. They line the river banks with their nets, casting them with remarkable skill and grace. The Orinoco fish are world famous for their quality and quantity. Many of them are sold to canneries, a newly developed industry. Others are taken home and cooked in the national dish, sancocho, a stew of fish, vegetables, and fruits. High up in the Andes, above Timberline, over two miles above sea level, is the village of Mucachias. 
Near it live a sturdy mountain people. As their Indian forefathers did in Bolivar's day, they still travel on horseback and on foot. The Venezuelans who live near Mucachias have plenty of milk, butter, and cheese. used for pack animals are stable near the house. Most of the mountain homes are built around a courtyard or patio, center of the many family activities. Not all houses are as large and attractive as this particular home. But even the poor people are great lovers of flowers and potted plants. Both men and women spend their spare time making closely woven straw hats, which can be bought in the village markets for a dollar. Sometimes they make their own shoes from old automobile tires. There is always wool to be spun, which will be turned into blankets and ponchos. More important than any other home industry is the hewing of their wooden plows. Life is a tremendous struggle for these people. Wood is rare, and modern farm implements are almost unknown. With their homemade wooden plows and stumbling oxen, they must tear up rocky soil on slopes almost as steep as cliffs. With superhuman toil, they raise their crops of corn, potatoes, and wheat. After the wheat is harvested, it is threshed in primitive fashion. Animals tread it out, and the chaff is separated by throwing it to the four winds. Containers made from cattle hides serve as a granary. The milling into flour is done with a stone by hand. Thick white cornbread, called arepa, is one of their staple foods. The wisdom of Mukachia's chickens is proverbial. They always seem to know when dinner time is approaching. A favorite delicacy which must be picked with care is the fruit of the tuna cactus. Perhaps the high altitude at which it grows adds to the exotic flavor of this tropical plant. For the more fortunate families like this, there is plenty of food which they have raised themselves. Many national leaders, including the dictator Juan Vicente Gomez, have come from such stock as these vigorous mountain people. That a man half Indian should rule Venezuela for 27 years occasions no surprise when it is remembered that there is no racial prejudice in this country. Intermarriage of different races is customary. On rare occasions, these people leave their mountain homes and travel over rocky mountain trails as much as 30 miles or more to reach a town like Tovar. The trip often takes all day, with frequent stops on the way. 
After a short rest, they resume their journey on foot and with Burrow to Tovar. Only a mountain town, to them it is a mighty city, center of the universe. Here they may spend a morning doing their trading in the little stores or in the open market. They are awed by the great church and by the religious ceremonies which often take place on market day. Every boy wants to set off a skyrocket from his bare hand during the daylight fireworks, which are a feature of Latin American fiestas. Watch the man with the cigar. The afternoon's climax comes in the favorite sport of coleada de toro, or twisting the bull's tail. Venezuela contains only 600 miles of railroad, about the distance from Boston to Cleveland. The highways mainly stem from the Trans-Andean Road and are concentrated in the north. Like Americans everywhere, the people travel by autobus, big, shiny, and red with luggage piled high on its silver top. Excellent bus services go from coastal towns to Caracas. And from Caracas, follow the route of Bolivar's marches across the Andes, 1,000 miles to Bogota in Colombia. Not far from thick jungle, the bus passes through an arid desert region where the cactus plant is almost the only vegetation. In dusty villages, the traveler is grateful for a short stop during which he can buy a refreshing drink of coconut milk. Before leaving the lowlands, autos are thoroughly sprayed with an insecticide. This rids them of malaria mosquitoes and other carriers of tropical disease. The road soon begins to climb again, up and up, over high passes. On his way, the traveler passes through mountain towns shaded by great trees, picturesque against the background of the Andes. Each town has its church and market, and little German stores which seem to be everywhere in the small towns of South America. Gomez, dictator though he was, 
left two good things at his death, many modern public roads and the only nation in the world entirely free from foreign debt. But the Gomez-built roads were constructed primarily for military purposes and as outlets for the products of his own rich estates. During the rainy season, almost half of Venezuela's main roads are cut off. The Orinoco floods some roads entirely, while others are barely passable. During the annual rise, it is necessary to ford unbridged streams, and an auto ride is a real adventure. In addition to this, whole areas of the country have no highways at all. But the government is taking steps to remedy these conditions. Today, under the present administration, a great wave of road building is sweeping the country. Villages formerly isolated are gradually being placed in communication with the outside world of education and medicine. But it is slow work, and it will be a long time before all Venezuela, with its tradition of manana and beneficio, has adequate roads. Much mineral wealth, including large oil fields, previously undeveloped, will become available as new highways are built. Foreign oil companies have spent millions of dollars in construction of their own roads from the coast to the oil fields. The oil boom began in 1915 at Lake Maracaibo. More recently, highly productive fields in the eastern Orinoco region have been discovered and developed. At Maracaibo, drilling is often carried on underwater. Venezuela's oil production comes next to the United States and to Soviet Russia. Whole towns have been built for the oil workers to attract the best engineers and geologists from Texas and Oklahoma the oil companies have created model industrial towns with warehouses, homes, and schools. The homes are most comfortable with electric refrigeration and all modern conveniences. Here in the evening, the foreign technicians relax at a game of dominoes. Busy executives travel to and from the oil fields in the company's private plane. Up-to-date hospitals with good clinics, doctors and nurses have been provided by foreign corporations, which have invested between four and five hundred million dollars in this country. North American products are commonly used. The grocery shelves look like those of a store in the United States. Most of the food for the oil workers is imported from the north. Exploration for oil is a scientific process. The men who search for it no longer use a divining rod or magic spell. They locate the untapped oil fields with scientific precision instruments called seismographs. Here with their drilling rig, they make a hole from 100 to 200 feet deep and explode dynamite on the bottom. With several dozen microphones, a field man records on a chart, like a hospital cardiograph, sound waves as they enter the earth and return. With thousands of such electric recordings, the geologists measure the thickness of the rock formation a mile or two below the earth's surface and determine where oil is located. The oil companies do big things in a big way. Huge storage tanks are transported overland to the new oil fields. And when drilling is ready to begin in a new field, 
a tremendous derrick is placed on skids and moved to its new location. Perhaps this is the only place in the world where derricks of such size and weight are tobogganed across country. This saves time and money which would be involved in the construction of a new derrick. The oil companies have helped make Venezuela one of the richest countries per capita in the world. The Federal Treasury receives from the oil corporations approximately 12 and one half percent royalty on all oil produced. This source of wealth has placed the country in a unique position. It is the only world power to have practically no domestic or foreign debt. And until now, it has had no income or corporation taxes. But the masses of the people are still poor. Tremendously high prices add to their poverty. Venezuela's adherence to the gold standard makes its cost of living among the highest. The noise and vibration of the giant machinery used in drilling for oil is nerve wracking, but the oil workers soon become accustomed to it. Most of the oil is sent by pipeline to loading ports for shipment abroad. Comparatively little oil is refined at home. From storage tanks at strategically located ports, the crude oil is placed in tankers. A large fleet of small tankers takes oil to the two Dutch islands of Aruba and Curaçao. At Curaçao, the whole island seems like one vast refinery. Dozens of small tankers come in each week with crude oil from the mainland, and large ones carry refined oil to the United States and British ports. Only a few hundred yards from these sentinels of the industrial age are the quaint streets and lovely colored houses of old Holland. Willemstadt, the principal city of Curaçao is cosmopolitan, as befits so important an ocean crossroad. planes of the famous Dutch line, KLM, connect Curaçao with the mainland of Venezuela, Colombia, and Dutch Guiana. Caracas is 3,000 feet above sea level. In this capital city, much of the nation's life centers. Founded almost 400 years ago, there is a strange mixture here of old and new. Its narrow streets and houses with overhanging balconies remind us of old world cities. Many of the windows have iron grill work of simple but effective design. Then in contrast, there are modern stores and the latest models of American automobiles. Perhaps the most imposing edifice in Caracas is that of El Capitolio, the capital, which covers two and one half acres. Built in 90 days some 50 years ago, its architecture combines the best of Spanish and Moorish styles. In the exact center of the city is Plaza Bolivar, 
with its pavement of mosaic stone. The fine equestrian statue of Bolivar looks in the direction of Plaza Washington, with its statue to Jorge Washington, as the Spaniards pronounce his name. North Americans, too, are interested in the plaza dedicated to Henry Clay, who in 1826 helped organize the first Pan American Conference. These three Americans had great dreams of a united hemisphere. But Caracas is not all monuments to the past. New and modern housing is being built, and a progressive city administration is building new sewers and resurfacing streets. Cultural institutions like the Art Museum are prominent in Caracas. The military school, Venezuela's West Point, is located on a hill to the west of the city. Central University has six colleges, including an outstanding medical school. Boys and girls are learning trades in business schools. Sons and daughters of the poor now have a better chance for education. As in commercial schools in the United States, they learn typing and how to operate calculating machines and how to do the most complicated accounting. They study stenography. But above all, they study English. As they learn English, they discover that the United States is their friend. They no longer fear that the United States is seeking to dominate Venezuela, as clever fascist agents would have them believe. They learn that both countries are benefited through exchange of goods, services, and culture. They know that only through such exchange can American countries become truly good neighbors. They remember that Bolivar and Washington secured freedom for the peoples of their countries. With Bolivar, they declare, we of the Western Hemisphere are not Europeans, nor Negroes, nor Indians. We are a new race, a mixture of all three. We are Americans. In Caracas, radio stations are being constructed, not subsidized by any foreign country, but paid for and operated by the Venezuelans themselves. The radio is used for education as well as for entertainment. The government has developed some fine agricultural programs. Weather and crop information is important in a country which is exerting great efforts to become self-supporting in agriculture. Programs go from Caracas to the country, to great estates formerly owned by Gomez. Here the government is running an experimental school, an agricultural farm. Splendid sheep are bred, and wool production is increasing each year. In every way, the government is helping to improve the standards of farming. A section of another model farm is devoted to cotton culture. Using the latest and most improved methods, the farm students dust the cotton to eliminate the boll weevil. In this, as in other fields, forward-looking Venezuelans seek for their country a balanced economy which will provide a higher standard of living for all. They see the dream of Bolivar, of a land without racial or class barriers, a land of abundance for all, draw nearer as Venezuela moves ahead. Mm -hmm.